Welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, today for another Eclipse Soundscapes community learning webinar. Uh, today's topic is Echoes of the Night Sky, How Audio Moth Technology is Enhancing Nocturnal Migration Research. And on the screen right now is an image of an audio moth recording device, which is about half the size of a cell phone. It looks like it has a circuit board on top and it just has about three batteries that attach to the back of it. It's a, a very simple recording device. So welcome. Um, my name is Mary Kay Severino. I'm the education director and co-lead on the Eclipse Soundscapes project. And I'm here with Kelsey Perret, who is the social media coordinator and content writer. And she is uh, helping us out with anything technical, also with questions. And then we have our guest speaker. We are very excited because Brad Bumgardner is here and he is the executive director at Indiana Audubon. And there will be time to ask questions. They'll be at the end. So there is a question and answer place where you can type them in. Uh, you can do that. You can also ask your questions out loud at the end, and we will give people the opportunity to do that. So our agenda for today, uh, just some quick Eclipse Soundscapes project updates, and then we'll jump right into hearing from Brad Bumgardner, and then we'll finish up with some questions for Brad. So some updates about Eclipse Soundscapes. Many of you here might be here because you were an Eclipse Soundscapes data collector and you might have used the Audio Moth recording device to collect some audio data during either the annular 2023 eclipse or the total solar eclipse in 2024. And there's a lot of stages to the data collection process. Uh, we had to receive and sort it all because everyone sent in their micro SD cards because it was way too much for people to try and upload of so much data. And then we spent time uploading all of those individual micro SD cards and then sorting through all that raw data. And right now we are currently in three different stages, which might seem weird. We're in the stage of uploading the raw data as well as segmenting or separating the data into some chunks that we can analyze. And also in the process of starting to share some of that data. And the reason why we're in all three stages at once is because we received way more data than we actually expected, which is a very exciting problem to have. We received hundreds more than we expected to come in. And so what we're needing to do is automate some of the elements of the process that we thought we would do by hand. And so there's some code writing going on to automate a little bit more of it. And we are actually making all of this code available on GitHub. Arisa Lab has a GitHub page. It's all publicly available, open source. And you can always go to eclipsesoundscapes.org to get linked there. So we are making everything freely available that we develop for this. And it is taking us a little bit longer to get through some of the uploading, segmenting, and sharing of this audio data, but it is coming soon. In terms of the observer role, some of you might have participated as Eclipse Soundscapes observers, meaning that during the eclipse, you observed what you heard, what you saw, what you felt, and submitted that information on a web form. And we're using all that information to learn more about animal response from all of that qualitative data. But we're also trying to figure out how participating in projects like this make people feel more connected to the scientific community or how people feel in terms of their science identity. And also, did people experience any awe or wonder or amazement during the eclipse? Those are some studies that are also happening with those observer notes. And we have some preliminary results to share. So November 6th, right around the corner, we have another webinar from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on EclipseSoundscapes.org, and we will be speaking with Dr. Kelly Lynn Mulvey from North Carolina State University. She's going to be talking about eclipses and awe and a feeling of belonging that resulted from some of this data that we received. So that's all very exciting. So I hope that you will join us for that webinar too. Again, that's November 6th 
from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time, and you can sign up on EclipseSoundscapes.org. So now we get to hear from Brad. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can hear all of this exciting information about what Brad is doing with the audio moths and all of their research. Hey, thank you. Let me queue up real quick there and there, there we go. So yeah, thanks and um, thanks for having me. My name uh, is Brad Bumgarner. I'm the executive director for Indiana Audubon and Indiana Audubon happens to be one of the oldest Audubons in the country. We were established in 1898. So we just celebrated our 125th uh, anniversary just uh, in the last year or so. And myself, uh, I'm a burger. And so like a lot of you guys on here, uh, you guys also enjoy birds, enjoy the, the sounds of birds, the, the bird migration. Uh, I'm really fascinated by migration. And I think it's so interesting to see some of the technology that's come out, some of the, the educational information that, that we have at our hands as bird watchers to learn about this migration. And then of course it connects that to the, the issues that birds are facing uh, in that migration. And we know a lot of birds migrate at night. And so, uh, Indiana Audubon has a program that we just kind of piloted, piloted this year that is really blending our mission. And our mission involves kind of three prongs, and it's research, conservation, and education. And so whenever we can kind of combine that and, and educate folks and engage folks with this cool science, it is always a plus. And, and I think that we are in sort of a, a new golden age for, for birding and bird watching with all the new technologies that come out there. And, and for me being one that, that's really kind of fascinated with migration, I, I love bird sounds. And, and we know that if you go out, three out of four sounds, uh, three out of four birds that you may detect in a morning, you heard versus seeing them. They're so hidden and the bird calls are, are species specific. So, so using all of that knowledge, we can take little devices like these little audio moths and learn so much about bird migration. And the Indiana Audubon program that we piloted this year is called Echoes of the Night Sky. And what we've been able to do is, is take that technology and get it out in the hands of individuals that can learn how to use these devices, how to analyze these sounds that are being collected, and then actually identify the bird species going over your specific roof. And we know that birds, since they're migrating at night, they're everywhere overhead. And as part of our program, our goals is to take this knowledge and present it out there, make an awareness across the state of Indiana and other states uh, as a migratory flyway. And so we can be looking at those bird species that are going ahead and facing, looking at those issues that birds are facing and really start to kind of connect the dots through the various programs that, that we offer for the public. And with our program, uh, this isn't anything new. We are kind of blending and melding all these different technologies that are coming on now. And many guys may have seen Cornell's BirdCast where they're taking that, that Doppler radar technology and able to predict how many birds are, are flying and, and then record uh, an estimate of millions of birds that might be going overhead in certain counties so that there can be lights out alerts that are coming in. And so now we're actually be able to take that knowledge that we can see on that Doppler radar and then actually tell you what are the birds that are flying over, which ones are coming, when are they coming, and all things that we can then further connect those dots, those conservation stories. And so you, you've probably seen this before. This is a typical, typical Doppler radar night. So this is an October 16th night where, where you see that blow up of those kind of donuts and those donuts represent birds in migration. So as that sun sets, they, they come up after dark. And so by migrating after dark, you, you have less wind, you have less atmospheric conditions that are in the way and less predation as well. So you're not going to have the various hawks and, and avian predators that might go after you. So you tend to migrate at night if you're a bird. Look at this. This is called, uh, uh, just like we might have on our phone, if you detect birds, you use Merlin, the Merlin app. Well, this is a Merlin, and it's this kind of a radar apparatus that not only records birds in a traditional uh, radar loop, but also in a vertical loop as well, so that we can not only see where their placement is uh, uh, at any moment in the night sky, but we can also look at what their altitude is in the sky. And with that, we get images like this. And this just shows the magnitude of nocturnal migration that we can record. This is a single shot on a night in May at the Indiana Dunes. This is in the Indiana Dunes State Park. 
every little streak is a bird that went by as that radar did a single pass and took about 10 minutes to do that single pass. And so it got every little streak of birds migrating. This is in the middle of the night. This is uh, like 11 p.m. And of course, as we go through the night, you see that bird numbers kind of decrease. And by the time you get to 8 a.m., you know, if you're out there on the, you know, mid-May, it's 8 a.m., there's birds everywhere. Wow, there's orioles, there's tanagers, they're all kind of coming in after migration. And, and this is what it looks like. I'm like, wow. If we had seen it just a couple hours earlier, turn on, you know, turn on the sun at midnight, our, we would have been blown away. There's so much migration overhead that we can detect. Here's another hot spot. This is my yard. And if you look around, you see a lot of houses. This is suburbia. It doesn't look like a birding hot spot. But as soon as the sun goes down and the birds start migrating, I have birds like this right over my head. I have bitterns and wimbrels and night herons and swans that are migrating over my house. And if they're migrating over my house, they're migrating over your guys' houses too. And so this year in our pilot pro program, we have all these little dots are places that have some of our various recording devices, whether they're SM4 units, whether they're audio moths, they're then deploying up on the roof in a bucket. And by putting in that bucket, we're kind of filtering the, the insect sounds and the car sounds around and just focusing on that overhead period. And so through our uh, Echoes of the Night Sky, we have a six part process where we re we're actually taking these units, training people how to use them, how to record, taking the files off, and they're actually analyzing it. So we're pulling them up, looking them on, on spectrograms. And because of the AI technology now, one specifically called Nighthawk, it allows us to analyze. And we've trained these programs with thousands and thousands of bird calls so that we can say with certain confidences that you had an oven bird, you had a white-throated sparrow, and you had a yellow-billed cuckoo that flew over at this hour, at this second. And we're able to gather all that species-specific information because of the sensitivity Activity of these amazing little devices. So, of course, we record. Uh, you see a lot of different devices. Uh, you, you may not be used to seeing the, the audio moths in the kind of casing, but you know you have your basic audio moth that just has the, the three batteries there. We can put them in these little waterproof casings. That way we can deploy them out in different locations, and they can be out there for a little longer periods if need be. You see there's kind of a, a little funneling right there where the microphone is on the, the one that I'm holding. We have smaller units, these little SMs, uh, these little minis and micros that Wildlife Acoustic makes as well. And they are really simple, may have just, you know, four little batteries. And, and a lot of these can configure to apps too. So you can actually configure what that schedule is going to be. And so we record at night, an hour after sunset, and we go all the way until an hour before sunrise. And then once we recorded them, we can transfer those files. So we have different wave files. We recorded that one hour period. We can run it through our little Nighthawk programs. And you see that Excel sheet. That's an example of, of an audio moth that was out on September 13th. I'm sorry, this was not an audio moth. This was uh, an SM4 on September 13th last year at midnight. And, and you can see that over the course of that one hour period, we had some 30 some bird detections and every line is a bird chip overhead. So literally a bird every two minutes was going by calling. And as I'm looking by on that list, I see there is an oven bird, red star, Savannah sparrow, Cape May warbler, grasshopper sparrow. It's amazing the things that we're able to detect and use the software to identify for us as well. And with that, then we can actually take those uh, with spectrograms and clip those. And so I might pull it up on a program such as Audacity and, and then we can look at where we have identified bird calls. I can clean those up, clip them out, and then we can put them on eBird checklists. So then we're really integrating into that citizen science so that all the data we collect is also available out there for people to see when the different periods of night, nighttime migration and what birds are going by. And collectively, we can even do trip reports. And so this is all of the checklists of nocturnal migration from all of our devices in the month of September. And if I scroll down through that list, you're going to see you know, some of the common migrants like Swainson's thrushes, where you have like 1,500 that were identified uh, when, they, when they host those big migration nights. And so we're able to figure out when those big nights are as well. Another example, is, look at this. This is, you might use Merlin. You sit there and you hold it and it identifies the different calls that are, that are going by overhead. Well, we can actually take these 
audio mobs and continue the recording into the dawn period. And so as you get through migration and you get into the breeding season, these devices out over a wetland area can record and get things like secretive marsh birds, things like bitterns and rails that get really hard to detect. And, and just with these little guys there. And so what I'm able to do is take little morning recordings, take out that little SD card, and just with a, a little kind of doohickey dongle, I can plug into my phone and actually upload them to Merlin and import my recordings and actually get detections through some of the software that, that we use right there on our phone. And so it goes beyond a nocturnal recording, and we're able to, to extend uh, these uses to, to other applications and other research projects. A lot of our volunteers are learning what uh, bird calls look like by visual appearance. And so just as you hear bird calls and you learn them, there's a spectrogram and you can learn those patterns and, and get to recognize calls right away. And, and I think that our volunteers that, that really get into these soundscapes and listening and reading bird calls, I think they really understand and learn these calls better. And it makes them uh, better birders in the field when they hear various chip notes and such that normally we might just pass off as unidentifiable. Uh, but with the new technology out there, we are learning that that's not always the case. And we're continuing uh, to learn more as part of our Echoes of the Night Sky. So currently we have uh, units that are out there deployed uh, throughout the state, in fact, uh, with the additional audio mobs that we were able to receive uh, for use, uh, we were even in Wisconsin. We got a couple of grad students uh, in uh, Madison that are testing these units, and we're able to use this and check how different devices compare in different landscapes. And so are some of the different devices better at low range or high range sounds? Uh, how do they deal with some of the different noises that, that we deal with, especially in some of the urban landscapes uh, that despite that, we know that more birds are migrating in there because of a lot of the lights uh, that are in these urban areas. And so there's so much that as we get through this pilot season, we'll be able to expand, use this data to continually educate and uh, do further outreach on light out events. And I look forward to being able to do season two uh, next year as well. And so that's just kind of a little snapshot of what we've been doing with uh, our uh, audio mobs uh, here with Indiana Audubon and the, the Echoes of the Night Sky. Of course, that's just a, a glaze over. I'm sure there's tons of different questions, uh, application and, and logistics of it, but I'm happy to help with that. And I'll also leave a, a, a link in the comments if you want to learn more about our uh, program with Indiana Audubon. Thanks, Brad. That's really awesome. A lot of great information. And there's a couple questions um, that are waiting in the Q&A. And uh, I'm going to read some of them out loud. So Judy Miller asked, can I check eBird to find the recordings in my area of migrations using this data? Yeah, so if you actually visit the uh, Indian Audubon's uh, Echoes of the Night Sky page, down at the bottom, we link to on eBird, where you can actually see the results from each month. So we have uh, March, April, and May from the spring season up there, and then you can see September, uh, actually August, September, October, and if we get any November recordings, uh, we'll have those as well. And that's probably the easiest way is through that trip report. Uh, if you are an eBird user, you can do different search functions and you can search by species. You can search uh, different audio recordings uh, for those areas and get a pickup of those as well. But the trip report is the best way. And then you can actually see the recordings. You can see the location, the dates, and the individual counts for each of these species as well. We have another question. And after I ask the question, I'm actually going to give a little bit of an answer myself and then I'll pass it off to you, Brad. Um, so the question from an anonymous attendee is, any thoughts of including blind and low vision citizen scientists in the project? And so I'll pop in with a little bit of an answer from the Eclipse Soundscapes project, because as some of you attending this might know, we've thought a lot about how to make all of this work multi-sensory and thinking about different ways to add tactile elements to the audio moth devices and one of the things that we're working on as we're starting to delve into all this analysis is how do we take some of the data that is being output, um, which I know we haven't shared with you all yet, so it will come, but how could we start to make that tactile? And is there a way that we could start including ways for people to be able to print some of those graphs and elements in a more 3D printer tactile way? So stay tuned for how Eclipse Soundscapes is going to start trying to figure out 
how to make some of that more accessible. But the question is for Brad, and if your group has started thinking about these elements, and I'm guessing especially related to some of those charts that you showed where there was the bird call, which was demonstrated on a graph that kind of had the, the markings that went up in a sharp peak, or maybe it was a shorter, flatter row that denoted which bird might be might be speaking at that time. So, so yeah, so we're looking at it visually. I'm, I'm trying to understand what the question is. With it, I can show it to you too. I'll pull it up too while you're repeating it. So the question was, any thoughts of including blind and low vision citizen scientists or participants in the project? And what I'm thinking of when I read that question is there were some elements that you were talking about with some of your participants getting better at looking at visuals of graphs to be able to use that visual element to determine if it's a chickadee or or some or a hummingbird and so has there been any thought about how some of those elements might be made more accessible i'm gonna be honest i don't know um not being familiar with the technology that might be available um, you have the, we're, we're able to get a, a sound and we can take that sound and, and particularly slow it down uh, is one of the things that we can do because it's so fast. It's just a little chip note. And so then we are able then to, to visually see that. And, and really, I think the benefit comes in is for, for those that are not uh, musically inclined, for those that then that really kind of focus on that skill set and, and have that really strong you, you have that ability. You can almost like you visually see a sound. And I think, you know, for me being able to see that, then it allows me to kind of start to have that connection into that ability and start to learn more about how sounds work. But in terms of if you can't see it without some sort of like, uh, you know, some sort of sound to text or like vibrational technology, um, I'm not sure really how to, to make that more accessible to, to that audience. Well, I'll, I'll finish the end of that good will talk because that's part of the piece of what we're <laughs> what we're working yeah. on and where yeah. we are working on figuring out. So I appreciate that question because it is definitely important and something that that we're all thinking about. And um, so it's it's important to just have these kind of brainstorming conversations. And I really like your idea about mm -hmm. the the slowing down of the audio. So that's not mm -hmm. something that we've started um considering at the moment we've been thinking a lot about tactile elements um but yeah so mm -hmm. stay tuned anonymous attendee <laughs> you know definitely as we're recording sound as the, the technology is changing we're seeing better integration with cellular connections wi-fi connections and now we're seeing the next generation of these devices that are hooking into um, home networks and so you can literally have this up on a roof and then it, it's in on an app and it may be playing in the house so that you're hearing amplified the sounds that are overhead going in whenever you want to listen to it and you have it uh, streaming to a device online where I can go and I can go to Mary Kay's house and I can listen to you know it live right now and it's actually telling me what it's identifying as well with that AI technology and it's all just you know live streaming and just concur uh, continually updating on the websites. Um, I will for now mark that question done. However, if the our conversation has generated follow up questions. Um, regards what we were just discussing, please let us know. Also, I want to make sure that if anyone has raised their hand, that they also have the opportunity to ask a question. We'll do some out loud questions. Um, Adrian, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Am I coming through? <laughs> yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, so actually, I was anonymous attendee, <laughs> so I want to ask a follow up now uh, having to do with that aspect of um, the blind and low vision, because I'm involved in um, sonification, understanding about sonification and how that's used in astronomy as well as in other fields. And so that has gotten me thinking when it comes to bird calls, which are not sonifications of data, but how the sonification techniques could be applied also to natural sounds. So 
sort of making a connection between those different fields. So that goes to both the eclipse soundscapes, but also to what Brad's talking about. Um, so what I was wondering was if Brad was working with blind and low vision people as any of the citizen scientists, because as far as astronomy goes, there are more opportunities being made available using astronomy data being turned into sound. So I was wondering if that was something he was considering. And I do want to give a shout out to Brad because he was my trainer as a certified interpretive guide a few years ago. So um, he's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, we don't have, have any participants uh, that, I, that I'm aware of. So in your case, you're taking uh, solar information and, and translating it to sound, right? But in here we have sound and we're translating the sound to data. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, because I've had conversations with other people about this is, could, could you consider bird calls as sonifications? And they've said, not really because it's a bird call or a bird song, but it seems like there might be some, some connections between what's being done because the birds are obviously communicating some sort of data in their calls. And you know this better than I, I'm sure, mm -hmm. what they're communicating. Um, something that that we have explored in the world of, of sonification, especially as it relates to data sharing, um, is the idea of when you have something like the graph or the, the bar or the line that demonstrates how high or, or the pattern or shape in that graph that a bird sound is making, then that pattern or shape itself could be sonified. So that would be a different sound than the sound of the birds. So that would create an opportunity for you to hear perhaps the sound of the bird, but then also use the sonification to be able to, in your mind, um, identify the pattern by that sound. So I know that that is something that, that we've explored in other areas as we do some work in terms of astrophysics and data sharing in that regard. So we are in some sonification chat groups, but in terms of as it relates to nature, because it does already exist in sound form, rather than adding an additional sound of the sonification would essentially be taking the bird sound, creating the graph, then using sonification best practices to use the tones that would be appropriate for those points in the graph. Um, that's why we started heading down the route of tactile. And so could that element be considered in a more tactile way? Could the, the graph or the spectrogram be printed on a 3D printer? And so therefore those raised elements would be there since the sound already exists. So in that situation, um, and we're focused on crickets, but I can apply it to birds, then you could be listening to the actual bird sound while feeling the tactile of that graph that was previously 2D, but then becomes 3D. Um, so to most of what we've done, we've decided to go that route rather than adding additional sound layers. But sonification as it relates to data sharing is is very exciting and there's a lot of work being done there to figure out how can we stop taking numerical data and making it always visual. Numerical data is just numbers and the way that we choose to share it can change. And up until this point, we've chosen to share it with graphs and lines and plots and I've learned how to utilize, visualize all of that data. But starting to figure out how to use different tones and chimes and be able to, in an auditory way, understand the data is definitely uh, an exciting element that I think will make all data analysis more accessible. Yeah, one, one of the things that Brad was showing that I think could really be powerful as a sonification would be those images of the visual of the night sky where there were all those flyovers. And I was thinking about Indiana sometimes called the crossroads of America because of the highways that go north and south and east and west. That's also like the flyways of America. <laughs> when, when you see those images, if you could convert that to some sort of sound, like here are the numbers of sounds that are heard for a daytime image or daytime data. And then here's what happens at night. You'd be able to perceive that orally. Mm -hmm. As in addition to visually, and it just uh, I, I, the reason I mention all this is just a way to include more people in the field of citizen science. 
It's when you get the biggest nights, it's it, Swainson's thrushes. They have a little call that they give, kind of sounds like a, a spring peeper call. And and when they're in a heavy migration, it is nothing but sleigh bells. Meep, 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 meep. It's just all constantly, they're all overlapping each other. And it's just so incredible. And but a lot of the calls, like these sparrows, chip, 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 you know, they're so slight, your ear can't tell them apart, but they're different species. And so when you when you're starting talking about that, the sound, the sound is really hard to hear because it's short, it's it's high or sharp. And so like maybe translating it and then you you assign each bird a different tone or sound and then as you listen to it with new sounds assigned to each species then maybe you start you start to get a symphony uh, that sounds much more like a symphony of tones than if you're just using the bird call so i could see where you would swap out and then actually create a separate soundtrack of just assigning the different tones of different species that you've identified yeah, that, that's exactly what the sonification could do because when it comes to astronomical data, that's what's done to take images from different wavelengths of visible light or UV or, or infrared or X-ray or whatever, and then different tones are used, different instruments are used, so you get a, a you get can have different visual images, but again, you can have different sounds so that you hear, oh, this is what high energy data is like in low energy data so you certainly could do that where you could identify the individual species and then they could have different instruments or different tones or timbres or high or low sounds there's a lot of ways you could go with that so that would be a cool project <laughs> it would thank you <laughs> Would it be a symphony or would it be a chorus? I don't know. <laughs> Exciting. When we're also able to identify these the species, a lot of times the, the education and outreach that occurs during migration events is, you know, look at all these birds that are dying. Look at these birds that are hitting into things. And, and so when you're trying to engage with a business or a building and and it's a negative, you're killing birds. Instead, if you got these recordings going on, hey, look at all these birds, you know, including these state endangered or threatened species that we've recorded that have successfully migrated past your building thanks to, you know, efforts that you're doing. So you can kind of turn that message to one of more positive. So when they make the bird calls, they only make their bird calls during the day. Is that correct? Well, uh, so so birds will have their songs and, and various call notes that they're communicating during the day. But at night, there's a whole series of uh, calls that are given. A lot of times they're just contact call notes. They may just be kind of communicating to each other. Uh, some birds, it's their full call. If you know the kill deer, that good deer, good deer, you'll hear that overhead at, late at night as well. And so it's the same sounds that we know. But for some species, they're very specific. Uh, we call NFCs, night nocturnal flight calls that are pretty distinct that you may not hear if you're birding, you know, the next morning out in the field. All right, so I think that Kelsey will be able to press a button so that uh, anyone who wants to unmute themselves and be able to ask a question out loud can do so. And while she's pressing that button, I'm going to read out loud a couple of the questions that we typed in the chat. Uh, one of the questions was, how do you learn about the AudioMoth device? Um, there is a page on the EclipseSoundscapes.org website. If you go to the data collector section, there's a tab all about the AudioMoth and uh, how we used it. There's a guide. There's also some information about how we made the AudioMoth more accessible by adding some tactile elements to it and then updating the directions. So they reference those tactile elements um, so that you can tactily find where the micro SD card goes and where the on or the three different switches are, those sorts of elements. And those are all referenced in the online guide. So you can go to eclipsesoundscapes.org. Um, and also, if you wanna learn more about the audio moth, you can also check out the information at open acoustic devices as they are the ones who have developed this. 
And so I will read out the website, but then I'll also drop it in the chat. It is openacousticdevices.info forward slash audio moth. So they are the ones who developed it. So if you're interested in going right to the source, you can also check that out. So let me put that in the chat. And someone else asked where this will be available later. Will this recording be available? And it will be available later. Um, it will be posted on the EclipseSoundscapes.org website and in the Eclipse Soundscapes learning community section. So you will be able to, uh, oops, I didn't send that to everyone. There we go. Um, so you can check it out there and uh, watch it again. It'll probably be up by this Friday or maybe Monday. I believe those are most of the questions that were typed. Um, let's see. I believe that was all the ones that are typed. And then I'm going to pause for a second in case anyone wanted to uh, just yell out their question out loud. I was wondering how many audio moths do you have set up in Indiana right now? Uh, we've actually received, uh, oh geez, was it 10, 10, 12 uh, that, that we were, uh, we got, we have about uh, five or six that are out right now. Um, and so we have various posts that are both deploying them separately and then also doing side by side so that we can get comparisons of the audio data and the detection rates. And then we hope to, for the spring season next year, between Indiana and the surrounding states is have some additional participants so that all the rest of the, the audio models that we have will be deployed and part of the project. And it does take a little more work than uh, just recording, you know, and, and sending in the data. So we are training our, our volunteers to, to be able to upload, use that AI technology, be able to read Audacity, be able to read these uh, audio clips, export them, and create their own um, eBird checklist. So uh, we're not just giving you the fish, we're, we're making you learn how to fish as part of this project. And uh, so then we hope to have enough folks to have all of our audio models out by the spring migration. That's great. And what would be the best way to follow up? Because the idea of a symphony of the calls at night, I'm really intrigued and I would be interested in working on a project like that with. Sure. Indiana. Yeah, in the comments, if you, you <laughs> click on the, the Indiana Audubon, the, the nocturnal, the Echoes of the Night Sky project link, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll have some contacts and uh, you can get hold of uh, Whitney and she can kind of, uh, you can also look at several of the documents that we have that kind of give uh, a really good tutorial on kind of the expectations and some of the things, the uh, requirements that you may have on your end in terms of like your computer and such to be able to process, you know, a lot of the, the data that's going uh, through uh, through your mic. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Mary Kay. <laughs> You're welcome. And Mary Kay, when you were talking about um, 3Ds, are you talking about actual 3D printing or are you yeah. talking about like the raised images? So we're exploring a couple of different options um, in terms of 3D graphs. We've already explored using 3D printers uh, that are in libraries and makerspaces. So trying to consider what is available to most people as opposed to making 3D print files where you would need like a pretty serious printer to make it happen. Um, and so we did some 3D prints of some cricket um, sounds and spectrograms that were created from cricket sounds and used those 3D prints and brought them with us to the National Federation of the Blind conference this past summer and just got some feedback on how much they made sense, how interesting it was to feel that spectrogram while also listening to the cricket sounds in conjunction. And we're also playing around with what we could do with raised graphs. Um, There's also other devices that people use to be able to have more of a 3D of a graph, like a device called a graffiti, um, there's also a Monarch. These are basically just devices where you can feed in an image and 3D, whatever it is that you fed in gets created. So we're, we're considering all of these different elements, especially now that we're just getting into being able to start doing this analysis. Um, we're still trying to sort through everything, so we're not quite there yet, but 
what we've considered throughout this entire project and what's changed the path of this project a few different times is making it as accessible and inclusive as possible and really considering um, anyone that might have been excluded from visual events like eclipses in the past. And that's why we spend a lot of time focusing on um, considering how to make elements of the project and all of the project really accessible to any member of the blind and low vision community, because that group has been left out of things that were perceived to be visual. And if you got to go out and experience the eclipse, the eclipse is not just visual. You can feel the temperature drop. You can hear the sounds of the animals change because suddenly they think it's night when it was supposed to be day. Um, so there's there's a lot of cool multi-sensory elements and that's why we also made sure to think about how to make things like devices and equipment more accessible. Um, like I mentioned earlier, adding tactiles or bump dots, which are basically just little silicone stickers that you can attach to a device in order to have a tactile element that would guide you towards that switch or that port. Um, so considering that not just the website should be accessible with the directions being accessible, but how's the equipment accessible? So I went on a little bit of a tangent there, so I'll stop. Now that, that's very helpful to hear. My understanding from the more I learn about sonification and the groups that I'm involved with, the projects I'm involved with, is that multi-sensory is better for everybody because we all learn in so many different ways and it helps to process information and make different connections. So it's great to hear that more people are, are doing that as well. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm an educator by trade. Uh, so I was in the classroom for many years and more information is retained when students interact with whatever they're learning about in a multi-sensory, multimodal way. Listening, being movement, touching, um, all those different elements. And the more that you have, the more that it it cements that learning in your mind, but it, it also makes you more in the moment. So with the eclipses, people often came back to us and said, oh, if I was trying to look if that was a sense that was available to me and listen and feel, I was really there in the moment trying to experience what was going on. And that can be really powerful too. Yeah, and I'm sure Brad can talk to this as well because I had a chance to participate in one of his programs up at Indiana Dunes where they do a banding of saw wet owls and it changes perception of what that whole experience is like when a little owl creature is you know two feet away from you and you get to see it banded and and you get to see that whole process so that sort of tangible experience is is really very valuable and and engaging and lasting mm -hmm. you know ultimately in our, our outreach and education you know you're wanting to to make that that emotional connection or connection to that resource and and that's where you know where things as simple as this are just by connecting the dots. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that, that bird over there on my shoulder, that wood thrush, you know, we have a banding program that puts modus tags. We, we put modus tags on owls, then we can watch them go. And then just as you start to get detections and then you, then you see a bird in migration and you just realize, hey, they're all part of that same network, that same thing that we're, we're, we're starting to learn each individual piece of that story. And, and through all this work, individual work, we're just starting to connect each of those individual dots to, to what we can learn and what we can connect to as we learn that. All right, well, see if anyone has any last questions and we'll start to finish up for today. I'm going to check and see if there's any that have been typed and I don't see any here. Oh, wait, I do see one. Um, it's a comment, but, but uh, I have so much to learn. I thought that was an oven bird. Oh, I might be reading that wrong, or someone wants yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, real similar over my shoulder there. Uh, oven birds have little white spots, a little more olive back. This is a little plumper. He's got a couple more worms in his belly. Uh, looks kind of like a robin. That's our wood thrush throughout the eastern United States, but real similar to our oven birds. Uh, both are very vocal nocturnal migrants that our uh, audio models are recording right now. 
Oh, cool. I didn't even know there was a bird called an oven bird. I thought I was misreading. <laughs> I was trying to get closer to the screen and think I worn my glasses. <laughs> yeah, so. So, yeah, there's an oven bird. Oh, it looks so similar. It has it's a little yes. tiny bird with, um, looks like soft brown with some little speckly yeah. dots on uh, on its chest there. They look nothing alike on the spectrogram, though. Oh, interesting. All right. Well, thank you, Brad, for joining us today. Um, it's been it's been really fun and really interesting. Thanks for letting us uh, use some of these devices, and we're expanding uh, our knowledge base, and then we'll be able to turn that into real conservation and action uh, on the ground. Yeah, well, I'll say thank you to the uh, Eclipse community. Any of you on the call, if you're people who donated back your audio moth because you wanted them to keep getting involved in science and doing more, um, this is one of the projects where those audio moths went. So yeah. it's very exciting. Unit 174, we thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you, 174, mm -hmm. and also others that are not listed right now, but thank you, too. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, we have a, a few fun comments um, that are written out and I'll just, I'll just read them out for us. Um, as a first time volunteer for Echoes of the Night Sky, I have to say it's been an amazing experience. I'm fascinated with the variety of birds that pass over my suburban north side of Indianapolis home. A definite learning curve to it, but so interesting and exciting. Thanks, Brad. And thank you, ES and IA, such a great way to engage people and gather critical data on avian movement patterns. I was able to find some details on bucket design and sampling protocol that I was interested in on the ECHOES webpage. Keep up the great work. Thank you both. Awesome. All right, thanks everyone. And um, have a great rest of your day and Again, there is another webinar on November 6th. This one is with Dr. Mulvey, who is going to be talking about some research that she's been able to do from the Eclipse Soundscapes Observer role. So if you were an observer during the 2023 eclipse or the 2024 eclipse, uh, this research is being utilized. And Dr. Mulvey at North Carolina State University has utilized it and is going to tell us a little bit more about what she figured out as it relates to eclipse awe and science belonging. And so very exciting. You can sign up to attend that eclipsesoundscapes.org is where you'll sign up. And that one is on November 6th. All right, thanks. Bye everyone. Bye.